my message for you today. <clears throat> Here lately, I, I don't know how to explain. I'm a very, uh, I'll just say it like this. I am almost happy all the time. Bobby actually asked me today, said, somebody said, April said, April was praying for us, said, and you know what's going on in everybody's lives and everything, and Bobby looked at, where are you at, Bobby? Are you here? Bobby said, what's going on with you? I said, nothing. And I said, Seth, is there anything going on? And Seth, you know, was acting funny. He said, I can't tell or something like that. And Bobby was looking at me. I said, Bobby, I'm oblivious that anything's wrong with me. So if you find out what's wrong with me, let me know. I need to know. So, and I operate, I go through life like that pretty much 95% of the time. I'm fine unless my back hurts. My back hurts. And I'm diabetic and I can't eat all the Hershey bars or Snickers that I want. Other than that, I can eat fried food. Okay, well, I'm really not supposed Okay, I'm not supposed to, but I do. But here lately, I want to say this. Here lately, in our area and in just the people I've known, it's been a very, it's been a very difficult year. We have had a lot of funerals, a lot of suffering, a, a, a lot of death, and uh, just, you know... Right after Wayne Rabb uh, passed away, I saw Nan New at a ball game, and she said, hey, I want to I send you this short video that uh, um, Sheriff Patton sent to us right after Wayne passed away. And it's, it's about a 10-minute video, and it, I don't even know the pastor, but it's pastor talking about that God will not waste your pain. And I was kind of like, okay. And then right in behind that, a five-year-old was killed in an accident recently you know and I thought all right God what what in the world you know have you ever have you ever asked God what is this all about if you don't confess it I, I get it because we don't want to say that we doubt God it's not like you you doubt God but you just want to know what is he what is he doing with this this is why this why this but let, let me tell you we live in a abundantly blessed country where the tragedy of losing a child is a rarity and other people live in countries where people kick the doors in and they they shoot men and, and women in front of their children or they'll shoot the children in front of the, the mothers and fathers and it and it, it's a regular occurrence but as we live here in this abundantly blessed nation with most of us lay down at night where we sleep cool in the summer and warm in the winter and our bellies are never full, or excuse me, our bellies are never empty, mine is always full. But we live in a country where we, we're really not in want very often. There are poor people in America, although people don't like to say that, even though we're richer than 97% 90, of the rest of the world, there are, there are people who go to bed hungry at night. And when we look at all these tragedies, we want to say, God, what are, what are you doing? What is this all about, God? Why, why are you allowing me to go through this pain? Why did this good man die? Why did this child die, Lord? Why d does this person have this disease or that, that disease? And the whole thing was that God will not waste your pain. The, the why is, is this. Death and dying and suffering came into the world because God gave us free will. All right, what is free will? Free will was, I'll, I'll take you back to the beginning. When the Lord placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, He gave them two trees they could not, well, First off, they have one tree they could not eat of. They could not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And later on, they could not eat of the tree of life because the tree of life sustained them. And this is the way I understand it. So that tree of life, if you eat the tree of life, do you ever die? No. Well, Adam and Eve came into this world, into the Garden of Eden, without any restrictions that, except for one thing, is don't eat of this tree. And that's what we call free will. He gives us an opportunity to disobey or to obey. 
So you can disobey or you can obey. Would you agree? Amen. And that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And well, well, Brother Bo, why would he do that? Why would he allow anybody to sin? I've said this before, if you're new to the church. How many people are married or in a relationship right now? Okay. Bobby, did you make Laura marry you? No. You begged her, didn't you? You married up, didn't you, brother? I did. Chased her till she caught me. That a boy. All right. Here's the deal. God loves us, and he wants a relationship with us, but he will not force himself on us. Had you forced yourself on law, you would have gone to jail. Right? That's not love. That's stalking. All right? Your Father God wants your love, and he pursues you to love him, but he does not make you love him. You choose to love him by accepting Jesus Christ and obeying his commands. Can we agree on that? When God created the world, there was no sin, no death, no dying, no destruction, but our free will brought death and dying and sin into the world. Now, the Lord sent the remedy for that in Jesus Christ, that through him we can be found blameless and clean and restored back to God, you know, reconciled, meaning back in good relationship. So why do bad things happen? Bad things happen because we have free will, and because of free will, death and dying and suffering came into this world. That's how it is. You cannot blame God for all the death and dying in the world. God gives us free will. When evil men break into your house and kill your family, that's because they're evil men and they decided to be evil. Right? And it spilled over onto you. But this is, this is the great promise that I want to share with you. You should, be able to, you should be able to quote this one. I'll tell you, I'm going to come to that scripture in just a minute. All right. I'm going to back up. Going back to the sermon, the little, well, it was part of it. It was about 10 minutes of a sermon that Nan shared with me. And there was a, it's kind of an urban legend right now. They can't. They can't back it up, but most people tell it to be true, that Ernest Hemingway, you know, remember Ernest Hem Hemingway, you know, tell me some stories Ernest Hem Hemingway wrote, you readers should know, Old Man in the Sea, for, for Whom the Bell Tolls, is that Ernest Hemingway? Old Man in the Sea, where the guy catches the big fish and it drags him all over the place, all right, is that him? Yeah. Anyhow. Ernest Hemingway was the most pro prolific writer of his time, and it was told that he was sitting around a table with some other writers, and they got to talking about how short you could write a story. And Ernest Hemingway finally said, I can write a story in six words. They're like, really? He said, yes. Yeah. So I tell you what, let's all put $10 in the pot. And said, you all put $10 in the pot, and if I can't write a short story that you agree on that it is a good short story it tells the story then uh i'll give each of you ten dollars but if it tells the story then i get get everything that's in the pot and they all took the bet and this is what he wrote this was his story six words told a story it says for sale baby shoes never worn for sell, baby shoes never worn. Six words tell a story. What, what story was told right there? That a mother lost her child either before childbirth or during childbirth. Baby shoes never worn. You see, we all have tragic stories that can be told in just a few words. Some of the others that this unnamed pastor, I, I don't know who he was, shared. He said, we all have our own six-word story. 
like this one. There has been a terrible accident. What would that have been like had you received that call on your five-year-old? There's been a terrible accident. It tells a story. There's tragedy there. Six words. Or this one. I'm leaving the marriage. It's over. They're just gone. Six words. How about this in Natchez, Mississippi? Your position is no longer needed. How about that? Years ago, it was Armstrong, then it was the paper mill, then it was you name it. Natchez is in an economic decline, but we'll, we're going to ask God to fix that. But the other things are going to happen first. But your position is no longer needed now. What, does that st- what do those six words tell? You cannot feed your wife and children. You cannot afford your home. You cannot pay your car note. Six words that tell a story. This one is all too familiar in Natchez. Your cancer isn't responding to treatment. Six words. This one. You are not able to conceive. You can't have the child that you want. And lastly, the one that I've dealt with the most lately. Here's a rose off the casket. So many times in this church and other places, and I don't know why I get called to do so many funerals. I, I've got, I'm kind of known as the funeral preacher now. I, don't, it, it's, I just know a lot of people and do a lot of funerals, and I'm telling you something. I got asked yesterday, uh, I was at a family reunion, and he said, and my cousin said to me, I want to know something. I thought, what is this all about? He said, uh, and he's, he's my dad's first cousin, so he's my second cousin. He said, how do you preach a funeral for a lost person? I stopped for a second. I said, first off, I don't know whether they're lost or saved. I said, I don't preach them into heaven, but I don't preach them into hell either. I said, but for those that I see that have lived in such a way that I am convinced, I preach Christ. And I said, for those who are lost, that I'm fairly convinced because there's no evidence of salvation, I preach Christ. Amen? Amen? And on both occasions, I try to comfort the family. But I preach Jesus because Jesus fixes things. Jesus fixes things. When you think about your own six-word story, I want you to take just a minute to think about your story. What is your personal story of tragedy? What is your personal story of loss? What is your personal story of hardship? Or, Brother Bo, I can't condense it down in the six words. It's just too long and painful. I understand that. But really, we can usually tell in just a few words what's going on. Not even six words. I lost my spouse. I lost my child. I lost my marriage. Fill in the blank. I have cancer. And when you think about the six words or less that tell the story of your life, you think... How could this happen to me? Why is God allowing this to happen to me? Why doesn't God love me enough to fix these things? Well, we know this, and if you're part of this church, this body of believers, 
And you have to understand that we don't have a role, so if you just attend here, you've heard me say Romans 8, 28, you should be able to quote it with me. It goes like this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. It doesn't, this is a very misquoted piece of scripture. We'll say, well, God does everything. I've heard people at funerals made me sick. Well, God needed your husband to die so that he could have another singer in the choir. Shut up. If that's all you got to say, keep your mouth closed. That is painful. God wants your husband to die so he can fill his choir? No. You don't know scripture. It says that he's got angels going around all the time singing holy, holy, holy. Constantly. He doesn't need more angels in the choir. Well, God wants another little boy to run around at his feet. No. God did not do this. And don't say something insensitive like that. If you can't say something that makes sense, keep your mouth closed. Often, to sit and to hold someone's hand or to hug them is all you need to do. Romans 8, 28 is misquoted. And people say, well, God did this for a reason. That's misquoted. And we know that God works in all things. It doesn't say God does all things. It says God works in all things. All right? For the good of those who love Him and call according to purpose. So everything about your life, everything you go through can serve a purpose if you put God in the middle of the mix. Amen. Amen. Your pain can serve purpose. I didn't say your pain does serve purpose. Your pain can serve purpose. And God will not waste your pain. That's the title of the sermon. God will not waste your your pain. You see, our response to what God is doing dictates how we recover and what happens with that tragedy. Say it again. What we do with whatever happens to us and what we got allow God to do dictates What's going to happen? It's how you look at this thing. All right, what, what can, how can God use this? We need to ask that question. How can God use my pain to benefit others? What can I, what have I learned that I can share? Listen, mothers and fathers who have lost children, when somebody loses a child, you understand better than anyone else. You ladies who have gone through miscarriages, you understand that pain better than anybody else. And when you sit down beside that young woman, some of you older ladies who have been there, you can say, baby, I lost a child and I know it hurts. And I'm praying for you and I love you and I'll do whatever you need me to do to help you. That matters. Those of you who have battled cancer, you can sit down beside somebody now. See, God is not wasting your pain. You can sit down beside that person who doesn't know God and you can share Christ through your pain and their pain. God does not waste your pain. Your relationship with Christ and your life experiences makes you a powerful tool in God's hand if you'll only let it. You see... Your Father God loves you and wants to bless you. So often, when we look at our lives, we think of things and just the negatives that happen to me. The, the negatives that I'm going through, the hardships that I'm going through, the tough times that I'm going through. But we, we also know that Scripture tells us that we're going to have tough times. As a matter of fact, Psalms 30 and 5 says this about our tough times. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. These, these were where I wanted to be. Weeping remains for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. 
Weeping remains not. Matter of fact, I condense that scripture down to this. Weeping comes at night. Joy comes in the morning. You're going to weep, and then you're going to have joy. You're going to weep, and then you're going to have joy. It tells the story of God's love. There are going to be times that you go through hardship. Scripture never says that you will not go through hardship. On the contrary, your Lord tells you that you're going to face hard times. You're going to suffer. Jesus tried to explain it to his disciples. They were saying, hey, we want to go and be with you. And he was like, you don't want to go where I'm going. You couldn't stand it. Psalms is a great promise that we will weep and then we will have joy. Revelation 21.4 says that God will wipe away your tears. God will wipe away your tears. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, no more crying or pain. The old order of things has passed away. God will wipe away your tears. God will wipe away your tears. You see, there will come a day whenever you look back on the things that you've experienced, the hardships, even now, and you'll recognize what God's doing. But let me tell you something. We will, clear, we will see clearly when we get to heaven. We will know everything that God was allowing to happen and how he used that thing to benefit somebody else. Whenever you stand there, and I told you early in the sermon that you have a bunch of people in your gravity. You know what? You know what your gravity is? It means that people that are drawn to you, that are pulled to you, for some reason, they're, they're just always there. Do you know those people? Right? Have you, ever, have you ever said, why is he always here? Why does she call me every day? Why does she always want to go somewhere with me? Why is he always following me around? God placed them there. For you to have an impact on them. Yeah, I get it. Sometimes we can get tired of the people who are drawn to our gravity. Anybody ever had your atmosphere get so full, you're like, okay, time to clean a little house here. Got to get rid of, got to get rid of some people. If God put them in your, in your sphere, in your sphere of influence, if they're in your gravity, then they are you, yours to take care of. Right? That's not always fun, is it? My house stayed full for a long time. It still stays full, but it's not as full as it was. Because God placed people in our lives that we were supposed to pour into and take care of. That was the mission for that time. Now, I'm here and we have a church full of people that are drawn to each other. And the other folks in, in your area are going to be drawn to you because you have something that they want. Right? It's like bugs to a light. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Sing with me. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Y'all know that one? If you don't, you haven't been around very much. Right? Listen, people are drawn to light. And when you, church, are living as you should and your light is shining, people are going to be drawn to you and they won't even know why they're drawn to you. Don't resent the people who are drawn to you. God sends them there. We know this, 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, that God is faithful and He is able. This is what it says. But the Lord is faithful and He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. So my six words was that God is faithful and He is able. God is faithful. He is able. Six words that tell a story. Your Father God has not left you or forsaken you. Even on your worst day, He has not abandoned you. You are going through a trial. You're going through a time of testing. It's just part of life. 
I want to encourage you with this. And I'm not going to be long. You see, whenever we think about 2 Thessalonians, that the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. How many people have been going through a trial or a tough time, and you feel like you're just about ready to give up? Right? The Lord never sets a time limit on the test you're going through. He never says, uh, if you'll make it this month and a half, I'm going to give you some relief. If you'll make it these three days, I'm going to give you some relief. If you'll make it these seven days, you'll get some time off. If you'll make it these seven hours, I'm going to give you a break. If you'll make it this year, I'm going to give you a break. He never says that. But he does say that he is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. You see, I believe firmly that so many of us are right on the edge. We're just right there. We're really, really close to making it through whatever that trial is. We're like in the, <laughs> you know, if it, was supposed to, if it was supposed to go on for 24 hours, we're in 23 hours and 59 minutes and we quit and we never get to see what God was doing with that trial that calamity that hardship we quit when Tracy and I moved to Natchez I thought I was here to to coach that was what I thought I was here to do I, I left a place where I was coaching to come to another place and actually somebody took a picture of me and I had a smirk on my face because I always thought I could fix everything fix everything my statement to my wife is we would talk about it and she'd say I just want you to what Tracy I want you to fix it and I'd say, all right, I'll fix it. But if I fix it, it's fixed. Meaning we don't talk about it anymore because I was very confident in my ability to fix things. I'll take care of it. I think the biggest problem I had was that I always thought what I did was right, therefore I was satisfied. You're not always right. I'm not always right. But we were here. We were in Natchez, and, uh, and I'm coaching and teaching, and I'm doing all this stuff. And I'm telling you something, we had some strong conversations about leaving Natchez, getting out of here. I mean, things were not getting easier. They were getting harder. Her mom was sick. You know, AC was not what I thought it was going to be. We were really struggling, but it was not about that short-term pain that God even was, <laughs> that was, that wasn't what he was doing at all. It wasn't about the pain. It wasn't about the frustration. It wasn't about the suffering. It was about this. And him calling me back to himself, you see, because I have a real bad habit of becoming very self-sufficient. Right? When you're a fixer, you fix it. You take care of it. You don't need nobody's help. I can do this. My children don't know as many things as they need to know about Machinery, working on tractors, trucks, and lawnmowers and such because they could be standing there and I wouldn't teach them anything because I'll just do it myself. That way I can complain about it later because nobody helped me. Anybody else? Sorry, Seth. I'll take your help now, though. Now that my back is bad. <laughs> Push until God moves. Okay? Keep going. Be faithful and let God work. Amen. He will not waste your pain. He will not waste your pain. He will not waste your hardship. 
God is working. And God is able. I'm going to give you the last six word story. Jesus came to seek and to save. Jesus came to seek and save. That one is in Luke 19.10. Here it is. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Who was lost? We were lost. You see, whenever there was a falling away in the Garden of Eden, whenever Adam and Eve sinned, man became lost. And our Father God sent a part of himself and his son Jesus Christ to seek and to save the lost. Your Father God came to seek and to save the lost through the man Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. And you don't have to suffer. You just know that your Father God loves you so much that he sacrificed a part of himself so that you could be saved. If only you ask. Now, how many of us agree that the problem with Natchez is that we have a whole city full of lost people? Amen? A whole city full of lost people. People that are saved don't shoot each other. People that are saved are not racist toward each other. People who are saved help others. If the church was doing what the church had been called to do, there would be no poverty, there would be no need, because the church would be meeting those needs. There would be no shootings in the street because the church would be there intervening, talking to young men and young women about what it means to know the Lord and to love the Lord. But because the city's lost... We have a lost and dying generation and we sit on our hands on Sunday morning in these soft chairs and refuse to get out and work. Stand with me.